Welcome to the Big Unlock Podcast, your leading source for insights and best practices on the digital transformation of healthcare. Join host Patty Patmanaban, CEO of Demo Consulting and best-selling author of Healthcare Digital Transformation, how consumerism, technology, and pandemic are accelerating the future in conversation with healthcare and technology leaders. This podcast is brought to you with the support of our partners, Innovacer and Palbox. Hello again, everyone. Welcome back to my podcast. It's my great privilege and honor to introduce my special guest today, Tony Ambrosi, Chief Digital Officer at Baptist Health in South Florida. Tony, thank you so much for setting aside the time and welcome to the show. Well, thank you for inviting me. Tony, you've come into the role relatively recently. Could you, for the benefit of our listeners, tell us a little bit about Baptist Health briefly and then... uh, Maybe just a little bit on the current state of your digital health and digital transformation initiatives. Of course. So you're right. I started with Baptist about just under a year ago. Baptist is a uh, uh, regional system, provider system in South Florida, about 10 or 11 hospitals. 20 something thousand employees. And it's a, it's Baptist really is a big presence in that community. I have people who, frankly, they work for Baptist and they were born in Baptist and Baptist Hospital. So it's a a very, uh, it's a monument in in that community. So I would say in terms of digital, the Baptist executive team, uh, as well as some of the influential members of the board with experience in e-commerce and digital, have been discussing digital for a number of years, digital in sense of in the sense of sustained and coherent efforts to for the transformation. And uh, as I said, about a year ago, I was brought in uh, into Baptist as the chief digital information officer, with a laser focus on the driving the digital transformation throughout the entire organization. You know, obviously working with uh, clinical and operations and all the other constituencies. Just to give you an idea where we are, about three months into my tenure, I put together a digital strategy and a capability roadmap covering roughly the next 12 to 18 months and focusing on consumer digital experience first and foremost, and then uh, clinical experiences, and then, uh, of course, the uh, digital experiences for operations and, and, and other, other groups. And we started executing on that roadmap about three, four months ago, I believe. And uh, we obtained the dedicated funding for the program, you know, focusing on building and rebuilding the front door experience, as well as room experiences, in-room experiences, and telehealth. I would make one point here. You heard me talking about strategy, but also capabilities roadmap. I would say it's important to have an overall strategy, definitely. You know, as they say, you know, if you don't know where you're going, you you can't tell where to turn, right? But that strategy cannot be all-consuming to the at the cost of um, executing. That's why having a roadmap of capabilities and features and executing on it um, is very critical. And clearly, you know, along the way, there are things that you learn or you discover or you validate some things from the original assumptions that you didn't know and you need to know to change. So that's roughly where we are now. We're building momentum uh, in terms of both building capabilities and also talking about the digital transformation inside the organization. Sounds really exciting. And uh, Tony, you mentioned three aspects of your mandate. You talked about consumer digital experiences. You talked about the clinical, the caregiver uh, experiences, and you talked about how to enable the organization digitally. So let's talk about the consumer aspect of it. You came from a consumer-oriented industry, and uh, I'd love to hear your initial impressions as you came into healthcare on uh, where we are as a healthcare sector in terms of consumer enablement of digital experiences and what your top one or two priorities are in that context. 
Yeah, actually, I came from two uh, consumer-focused companies. Last, uh, Disney, Disney Parks, and before that, American Express, very similar focus. I would say that clearly, you know, healthcare providers, the doctors, the physicians, the, the, the nurses are intensely focused on the medical care for patients. And you know, the pandemic can show that relentless and ultimate dedication uh, of medical providers, to the patient lives and uh, well-being and health and well-being. Now, however, compared to other industries, the digital experiences in before the encounter, after the encounter, maybe even during the encounter in, in, the, in the rooms, patient rooms, clearly are behind what you expect in, in uh, different other industries. And think about just a simple, and I use this elsewhere, but I think it's, it's, it's great. Think about the Amazon shopping experience. And then clearly... Ordering a, you know, a, a ball of water on Amazon is nothing compared to healthcare, but, but still, think about this. If you, instead of the experience that you know at Amazon, instead you would be, be spending time putting down a list, then you'd get on a call and you would wait for 30 minutes to get to, to talk to somebody. And then you'd spend another 30 minutes trying to explain on the phone what, what the problem is, what your need is, what you want. And then wait another three weeks and just to discover that in, in reality, you didn't get what you actually wanted, but something similar. And that's kind of where we are today because of the imperfect, more than imperfect digital experiences. So, yeah. uh, so let's talk just a little bit about that. What do you see as the, the most stark examples of the difference between your previous experience and healthcare? Why is it so broken? Why is it? You know, why is it so difficult in healthcare? Is it just that healthcare hasn't grown up yet? Or is it, are there some other structural issues you see? What are the one or two things that strike you immediately? Again, you're still fresh from your previous experience, so you can still relate and compare and contrast. So I'm really, really curious to hear your thoughts on that. What are the one or two things that strike you the most? Yeah, no, I, I think it's a you know great question. And that's that's what I've been obviously asking myself and ourselves. Because I think it's a combination of factors. So I'll, I'll, I'll put the objective factors aside. Yes, you have this interesting dynamics between patients, the providers, and the payers. Um, that's a kind of a strange arrangement. And, and, and buying things and ordering things is impacted by that. Uh, you know, have to validate the insurance first, and therefore things are not as easy as you would, would be that if you just bought with your American Express card. So that's an objective factor, and I think that's that's part of the system. That, but nevertheless, that we need to work to to improve. And there are some things that we can do. On the more subjective part is, I think first, I don't think there has been a a, uh, a focus over the years on this aspect or on those aspects. And frankly, um, there are still some in the in the healthcare industry that I've heard, I've seen, that have the uh, the view of, well, uh, patients don't come here for the mobile app. And frankly, that's absolutely true. But also it's true that nobody goes to Disney just to use the mobile app. However, without that mobile app, probably they wouldn't do or use American Express or so on and so forth. So how we manage our services, the access to our services, with the consumers, it is important how easy it is. And frankly, at some point, it's a competitive advantage. All other things considered equal, consumers and, um, and patients would choose an easier experience to a more uh, difficult one. And frankly, uh, for the expectations for, for con from con the consumers have been changing for a while. And some of it is driven by their other experiences and their other life, their normal lives. Um, and they want to be part of the, uh, the focus or the center of the experience. They want to have control. They want to have uh, information to make decisions about their care. And they, as I said, they do expect the same type of experiences as, as elsewhere. Now let's talk about the clinicians. You know, the healthcare, you have a unique dimension, which is that the caregiver experience, the clinician experience, also has to be taken into consideration when you are looking at designing digital experiences. What, uh, and, and many of the health systems that we talk to, 
the biggest challenges are increasing adoption and awareness on both the consumer community as well as the clinician slash caregiver community because they have to recommend to the consumers to come on a video chat sort of coming into the clinic and so on and so forth. Where do you see clinicians in this context and what, in your view, can lead to better adoption rates among the clinician community? That's actually a, a great question. And by the way, when I was talking to, about consumers just a moment ago, certain to a certain extent that applies to, to clinicians having great digital experiences, in addition to obviously the normal experiences, that's a, um, a factor for clinicians, all other things being considered. As a clinician, do you want to go to the system that has horrible technology systems and digital systems and it's a pain, or you go to another one that uh, all other things considered? That's still the case. That's why that's a second focus aspect for us. I would say that adoption is is driven by, a lot of it is driven by uh, demographics, uh, number one. Uh, Then I would say uh, lifestyle. And uh, number three, capabilities, uh, simplistically put. Um, So demographics in terms of clearly the younger generations, let's say the up to 40s in their 40s, who have lived through the e-commerce experiences and digital experiences, clearly the, 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 uh, the folks are just under 25. That's a, a way of life. Uh, so there the adoption is, it is basically natural. For those categories, a video call is natural uh, for everything. So therefore, it would be natural for when a medical encounter, subject to other limitations, of course. Now, some of the more senior folks uh, they have other, you know, whether they have the uh, the experience and the knowledge, or also they have some uh, form factor limitations. So they, they would prefer a big screen versus a, a mobile. The life cycle is just as I said before: is really uh, folks who are very much into the Amazons of this world and the the social media and so on and so forth. It feels natural. It's just another another interaction. And that's true for both consumers and providers. Now for the providers, there's a little twist, I would say. And that is uh, digital in the healthcare, in healthcare, does require process changes to be, to provide the benefits. So some individual providers maybe don't like those process changes. It's just uh, maybe they feel that they're not convenient and therefore they will stay away from digital. Some provider systems will skew that process, those process changes simply because it's difficult, there's inertia, and maybe politics. So therefore, when digital is introduced, or I should say digitization, probably is more work and hassle than is worth it. Think about EHRs that really are problematic for physicians. I did say also the where we're talking about the third element, which is the quality of the experiences, I think in both cases, consumers and providers, I don't think the the quality of the technology and the digital experience has been great. We're talking about physicians. Clearly, we all know about uh, the pain that some of the medical systems, the HRs are for them. Yeah. So clearly, of course, uh, you know, in the last 10 years or a little more than that, the EHR implementations have burned out a lot of physicians and they've not been happy about it. And now this is one more layer of technology that's going to sit on top of EHRs. And maybe the EHRs themselves are evolving, but either way, there's another wave of technology adoption you're talking about when you talk about digital. This podcast is brought to you with the support of our partners, Innovacer and Powbox. Let's talk about the technology landscape itself. And you mentioned a couple of really important things. One is Physicians are very, very skeptical about any any new technology, especially if it's going to increase their workload. In fact, what I hear a lot is that the new technology, while it may be innovative and it may deliver some benefits and it may make things seamless and digital, it also increases work. Physicians don't like that. And for very good reasons, they don't have enough time. They don't have time for another new tool. What about the technology landscape? As a chief digital officer, how do you look at the technology solutions landscape when you're trying to address this? And uh, what a whole range of uh, technology providers and platforms and solutions from big tech, EHR, all the way to nimble, young startups. 
and you've dealt with all of them in your in your past life. So what does it look like in in your current role? I would say, by the way, I would say that it's true for anyone that we want to not have to deal with awkward and and solutions that make more work for us in whatever the profession is. That's absolutely true. So is is natural, I think. Clearly, for physicians, uh, especially during crisis, the, the things compound. In terms of uh, technology landscape, uh, it's interesting. Actually, I would say it's very interesting because you have some of the same type of uh, players. You know, the big tech on one hand, and you have the established uh, traditional technology uh, players that are not big tech, and then you have all the all the startups and so it, it but it's interesting so the interactions are somewhat or uh, the same but also they are somewhat very different starting with big tech it's not always clear at least to me and you know i may be wrong but it's not always clear what their strategic plan is and other than maybe selling more cloud and more devices and um, if you look at google and I'm, I'm only picking on on them simply because there have been some uh, recent news about them kind of uh, coming out of the healthcare or reducing their healthcare efforts. But looking back, I'm not quite sure what they were trying to do in the first place. As I said, you know, I heard rumors about them being in EHR, but I haven't seen very much other than very marginal, maybe API gateway capabilities. I'm sure there was somebody, but clearly something, but clearly they didn't think that that worked very well. So they're kind of uh, retreating a little bit. And if you look at also the like Haven, the, the joint venture between JP Morgan and Amazon and Berkshire, was the same, not quite clear yeah. what they were trying, trying to do. You look at, you have people like Apple. Uh, they seem to be very, very focused on uh, additional health capabilities in their devices, but it's uh, relatively, uh, relatively limited. And now, with that being said, obviously, all of us wearing a Apple Watch, we like some of the health capabilities that that provides. In terms of established providers, and in this category, I would say it goes, the, the EHR vendors go, some of them are very successful, but all of them, I think they have somewhat uh, old technology and, and technology stack. I think they have a lot of technical debt. They're trying to be all things to all people. And some of this is reminiscent to the uh, ERP and MRP space, um, they're slow to market. And some of them are still dreaming of closed platforms with customer lock-in. And they'll have to change simply because the other two categories and the fact that the world is changing. And finally, talking about startups, lots, lots of money, uh, VC activity, VC money going there, but I think it's somewhat probably scattered. And that's part of the, the way VC works. I see two different and somewhat polar opposites categories there. On the first, on the one hand, is there are some who are so certainly trying to emulate a, or to build a comprehensive but closed platform. They looked at presumably the big vendors, they said, hey, that worked for them pretty well, let's try it ourselves, which you either have to buy the entire platform or you can't, you can't use it. Even if they have the vision and the capability, probably in the best case, there's a doubt about long-term financial viability. So would you invest millions of dollars in a vendor that you'd be locked in and they could go away? On the other side, you have those companies that are very narrowly focused and they don't integrate very well into the ecosystem. And then you say, well, what do I do with this little piece when I have everything else around it and just doesn't work. And, you know, I've been talking to one of those where I said, yeah, I understand that the product has been launched successfully, I would say, some years ago in a kind of a somewhat of an independent fashion. But now that we're bringing in uh, the identity, the authentication, how would that work? I'm not going to force the consumers to re-input their data into your system just because because I already have that data, so it just doesn't make sense. So I think neither of those two, the last, the, the in the startup world, is a realistic approach. I think the startup should focus on very specific capabilities and do them very, very well, but also have APIs to integrate at all levels in the rest of the ecosystem. So you made some very interesting comments, especially about big tech and uh, Google 
Uh, actually, just recently, Google, their head of healthcare left and uh, to become CEO of Cerner. And I know you're a Cerner shop, so you might end up having a conversation with them or you can ask him what they were trying to do, uh, try to get an answer maybe. And, you know, Apple too, uh, they, they scaled back an uh, effort that they had going on, which was trying to get into the primary care space. So it seems like the big tech, the one part of it is the technology solutions business, you know, which is selling platforms, software, hardware. But there's also another part of them that is trying to get directly into the healthcare services business and competing with the uh, Baptist Health and everybody else. And so there's a line there, it seems that, you know, if we try to cross that line, then the dynamics change significantly. And Amazon's trying to do that with Amazon Care as an example. So it'll be interesting to see what, what comes out at the end of the day. But you made some very valid comments about the startup ecosystem, especially when it comes to you know, these standalone tools that may be very, very good, very, very innovative. They don't integrate with your backend EHR system. If they don't integrate, uh, firstly, you don't get a seamless experience. Then you, know, you have to invest a lot of money in building the APIs. It's very brittle, uh, increases your total cost of ownership and a lot of other issues uh, that, that you talk about. Again, it's all evolving. So I guess the only thing that we can do is watch and wait and make very carefully thought uh, choices when it comes to making your bets. Because to your point, make millions of dollars of investment in a company that may not be around three years from now, or may get acquired by somebody. And then all of a sudden, you're dealing with a whole different supplier. So let's switch topics. I'd love to hear a little bit about the governance model uh, for all of the digital programs. So you've got multiple stakeholder groups to work with. Uh, and you've got to drive change in the organization. Digital is all about change. Can you talk a little bit about your governance model for driving digital health at Baptist? Sure. So first and foremost, I structure the digital program as a you know place for all things to come together in a in a natural and and structured way. It has a strategy, um, has scope, priorities, and a roadmap, as, as we talked a moment ago for no more than 12 to 18 months. So everybody is part of that, that conversation. Second, I think what we did is we got dedicated uh, funding for the program as a concept. I know that in, in certain uh, places, the digital investments are uh, peppered everywhere in the organization. That's very hard to manage. We basically said, this is one program, therefore there's a long-term funding uh, bucket and, and we get you know, the bucket, the uh, money uh, required in tranches as we, we go along. Third, there is a digital council that I chair with very select stakeholders and thought leaders from the organization, from, you know, obviously from the clinical side, from the operation side, and so on and so forth. And then I think very important, very important for all, any transformation, digital or otherwise, a very comprehensive and increasingly well-developed communication plan, you know, whether with artifacts or internal wikis or live presentations and even demos to a variety of constituents. So let me drill into that just a little bit. So, it's, you know, what, what you described is, uh, is what we see in a lot of organizations. Now, a couple of questions. It's great that you have a budget. And you see, great that you have a digital council. I imagine that you're not directly accountable or responsible for everything digital in the organization. There may be parts of digital, for instance, uh, in the inpatient care situation or the remote monitoring pieces, or there may be other pieces that uh, may or may not be part of your mandate and your role. How do you make sure all stakeholders are working together in the same sandbox? and driving organizational objectives. Do you do that through the digital council? Do you do that through more informal interactions? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I think the answer is yes uh, to both. We have the digital council, but there's also a number of other committees, steering committees, boards that a number of us are on that try to ensure that cohesion. And by the way, not everything. It's important that digital transformation is not looked at as this, you know, born again, everything is different tomorrow than today. It is natural. And as much as possible, you know, based on that strategy, what is it, the strategy? Some things are done by my team. Some things are done by others. As long as it seems coherent and the result is positive, I think all is good. 
a lot of conversations, but that, I think that's that's natural. Well, that's great. And we're coming up to the end of our time here. I'd like to ask you just one last question. It's been a year since you came into your new role. What are the one or two learnings that you've had that you'd like to share with my audience? Uh, sure. I think there are a few. I would say, first and foremost, don't debate whether you need to do digital because you need, you do. There's just no debate. And as I said earlier, you know, define a strategy. We just describe why that is important. So everybody knows how to, to align, whether in spirit or, or in, in details. But don't, don't overspend time to, for the details. I was never one to spend two years on a strategy and, and then have to redo the strategy because the world is different. I would say have the right stakeholders and thought leaders with you driving the bus. So it's I'm driving the bus with them together. And thought leaders and influencers don't always have fancy titles, but they're valuable nevertheless. Have the right people on the bus. This is the team that will do the, uh, the implementations and drive the, the, the change. Uh, this is both from a professional competence perspective, but also mindset. But learn from mistakes. Mistakes will be made, but it's important to learn from the mistakes and it's important to be ready and have that team flexibility to turn around and fix those mistakes. I would now say that digital is not easy. Down, done well is not easy. Sure, uh, the Apples and the Googles and so on and so forth, they do it very well, but it's still not easy. And it does require a lot of focus and, and attention to details. And as we talked about it, for successful digital, the organizational processes and the business processes do have to change. As well said, so build an active and engaged community, make it inclusive, and make sure there's a free, free flow of thoughts and ideas, and let it all evolve organically. Don't overthink it. Basically. Yep. All right, fantastic. Tony, it's been such a pleasure speaking with you, and I want to thank you once again for coming on the podcast. We look forward to following your work and all the very best and success to you and your team at Baptist Health. Thank you. And and by the way, thank you for the work you're doing because we're all learning from each other and we're learning from you and 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 uh, you know some of the or the this all the speakers on, on your podcast. So thank you for doing this. Thank you. Really appreciate it. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. You can reach us at info at the with your feedback and questions. This podcast is brought to you with the support of our partners, Innovacer and Powbox.